Welcome to the Resource of the Future podcast series, a podcast series by the Canadian Chamber of Commerce that explores the present and the future of Canada's resource sector. Our focus spans the impact of the fourth industrial revolution on the agricultural sector, the evolving relationships of Indigenous communities to the resource sector, to technologies and new business practices that will be vital to our leadership towards a low carbon economy. Our purpose is to foster a better understanding of how our resource sector binds Canadian communities together, the challenges we face, and the opportunities before us as a nation of builders. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Resources of the Future podcast. Today, I am very lucky to be joined by Brendan Marshall, the Vice President of Economic and Northern Affairs from the Mining Association of Canada talk everything geopolitics, changing technologies perhaps, and as it sort of relates to, to critical minerals and, and metals. Maybe just to get us started off, uh, Brennan, one first, thanks for being here today. It's my pleasure, Aaron. Um, you know, why don't just to, to sort of put us off in the right direction, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at NAF. Sure. Well, as you, as you noted, I'm the Vice President Economic and Northern Affairs at the Mining Association. And to be a bit more specific, um, those are two strategic pillars of our organization's plan of engagement in the public policy space. And they tend to reflect hard competitiveness issues. So tax, trade, investment, energy infrastructure, and transportation. They also look at those same issues through uh, a northern lens when we talk about the northern affairs side of the portfolio. There's also a few environmental files that I work on, the biggest one of which would be climate change. And I'll just mention that because I think as we move through the podcast, that'll become a bit more relevant um, as we take a deeper dive on the critical minerals. Well, thanks so much for that, that overview and for uh, what I think is going to be a really great discussion. Um, you know what, and maybe just to, to get us right off on it, I think Canadians everywhere are probably finding that they're seeing the phrase, you know, critical minerals and, and sort of critical metals more and more. It's something we're hearing from policymakers. It's certainly something that we're, we're hearing in sort of uh, discussions from academics and economists. You know, can you tell us a little bit about what that means and also why are we hearing so much about it? I think that to properly understand this term critical minerals, uh, we need to look back a little ways to understand some, some context. So basically, in a changing, shifting geopolitical landscape that you know we can characterize uh, through recent trade tensions, most specifically between China and the United States, there's been uh, a general reassessment by countries, and it's not just the United States. It's, this is a fairly broad exercise that governments, a number of governments around the world are, are undertaking. But there's been a reassessment of the raw materials that are essential for the well-functioning of these countries' respective economies. And the term critical is added because these materials are not sourceable, either in sufficient supply or at all from within those countries' own borders. And so the implication is that there is a reliance, uh, an import reliance from a trading partner to source these materials without which their economies can't function. And so that creates a potential vulnerability to supply shocks in the event that the accessibility of these materials comes into question, right? Right. And given the increased trade tension globally, um, there's been a reassessment by governments about what those vulnerabilities are and what policy measures they can put in place to reduce the, the potential shocks of uh, circumstances whereby they can't access either sufficient volume or those materials at all. What does that mean for their economies? How can they prevent the types of disruptions uh, that that could result. And if I could characterize this with an example, I think that might help listeners better understand. Yeah. Um, 
there's there's one set of products in the minerals and metals space that characterize this dynamic. That's rare earth. The reason why rare earths get a bit of uh, greater focus, I would say, is because China is the largest supplier of these materials globally by far. And these materials are essential for the creation of inputs into advanced manufacturing technology. And so when we think about advanced manufacturing technologies, we're talking about a suite of products that range from you know, medical technologies, uh, battery, clean energy technologies, computing technologies, defense technologies, uh, the, the whole spectrum of the products that our modern lifestyle largely depends on. And in light of that sort of that geopolitical disruption between China and the U.S., that vulnerability in particular is brought into to sharp relief with concerns over potential downstream disruption in the manufacturing space. But it's not just rare earths, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's an, a, sort of a choke point for vulnerability. But the lists that countries have developed, for example, the list of critical minerals that the United States has developed, has over 50 materials on it. Wow. So it's, okay. a, it's a bit of a misnomer to think that it's exclusively rare earths. That's perhaps the, the set of materials that gets spoken about the most. But this is a broader whole of economy exercise, and that's the lens through which um, policymakers are looking at when they think about critical minerals. And I think that for the, for the audience of this podcast, it's helpful to understand that the scope of critical minerals, while it includes rare earths, is br much broader than that. Thanks so much for, for both the example and, and the overview. I think that's, you know, going to really help situate some people in, in this discussion. Um, maybe two things come to mind. One is, so this phrase or this, essentially this policy position has, has really kind of come to the forefront. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, as you described, part of this is, is geopolitical pressures, and that this makes a lot of sense. You know, we're seeing uh, Canada in a world where it certainly needs to sort of reconsider a lot of its, its trade relationships. You know, no question that we've seen repercussions from sort of an, an America and America first policy. And I, I don't think that's going anywhere, even with the change of administration. I guess the, the question might be is, you know, is what's making this critical, that shift in geopolitics that, you know, that essentially what we're seeing is sort of a, a deficit in globalization or a, a recession in globalization, as uh, Ian Bremer, Bremer has put it? Or is it also that, that we're starting to see new technologies that are really increasing the demand for those inputs? Is it both? Is it the combination? I think it's uh, both. The state of global trade is one where there's perhaps greater level of, of uncertainty uh, looking forward than there, than there ever has been before. And I think that um, in light of that, decision makers are trying to prepare for uh, shifts that are beyond their control, which is a prudent thing to do when you note that you have a particular vulnerability, it's valuable to try and get ahead and prepare for those potential disruptions. I mean, these are obviously not outcomes that we're hoping for, but I think it's better to be prepared than it is to be caught by surprise. But on the other side, you know, when we think about an issue like climate change, the forecast for technology development that's going to be required to reduce global carbon emissions is astronomical. And so in the, in the mining space, the raw materials required and forecast uh, to be required as inputs into clean technology alone, like we're talking in the hundreds of percent increases over the next five to 10 years for a number of materials. And that demand also plays an important factor in that, in that equation because Existing sources of supply for these minerals and metals may not be the the future supply right. of these same minerals and metals. And so, you know, as the economy adapts and as uh, those demands increase and as trade patterns change, trying to reconcile those variables with the the recognized need for a consistent, reliable supply 
of those inputs, I mean, ultimately, that's that's the policy goal. And I think that's a big impetus behind governments looking at critical minerals and uh, conversing with their trade partners about how they can go about strengthening their resiliency in the face of these changes. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, on that point, we have these shifting geopolitical relationships. Uh, we have the under, you know, understanding that we're going to see a, a huge, significant increase in inputs. And I guess the, the question that really comes to mind is, so how does Canada position itself in, in this world, right? Where essentially we, we do have uh, significant mineral assets that we currently are, are utilizing, and there's you know, more deposits that, that could be exploited. You know, how do we position ourselves to, on the one hand, ensure that our own critical mineral needs are, are met? You know, what's, what's sort of our list in terms of how many uh, minerals we're currently going to need to import? Um, but also, you know, what can we do to actually sort of really do well to, to strengthen ourselves on that exporting side of this? So I think that it's important to recognize the uh, early leadership that has already taken place on this issue. And that would go back to the MOU that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and President Trump signed, an agreement that ultimately led to a joint Canada-U.S. action plan on, on critical minerals, the purpose of which is ultimately to answer the question that you, that you asked. So in that sense, Canada is not behind the eight ball. Um, there's been infrastructure put in place in each government to, to support what needs to be done and the delivery of policies, programs, regulations, et cetera, to, to achieve success in this space. From Mac's perspective, we have a couple of recommendations that we've advanced to Canadian decision makers that we think would be helpful, uh, and they are as follows. The first is on the extraction and processing side, there's an opportunity for technological development that would help make the existing uh, and known rare earth resources more marketable. And what I mean by that is you can either mine rare earths, and then there's also uh, known rare earths in existing mine waste streams that can be collected, recycled, reduce mine waste, and create a new product that is uh, less costly and more environmentally friendly uh, than the alternative. And we need technologies to advance the ability to do that. The, the second piece would be there's uh, quite a bit of financial uncertainty on the extraction right. side. So if you're going to build a new rare earths mine, and there are permitted rare earths mines in, in Canada that, ha that have not been built, um, it's very difficult to get financing for a, a product that has no downstream market in, in North America. So right. what we need is more fiscal stability, more financial stability and certainty in the rare earths market to give those, those operations a chance to, to, get, to get financing and ultimately be built to, to produce this, this product that's in growing demand. The second piece is Mac has underscored that, you know, we're, we're just one segment of the supply chain here. Um, we don't have all of the answers, uh, particularly for more downstream segments of the supply chain. And our, our final recommendation acknowledging that is that uh, it would be useful for the government to create a joint industry uh, government task force that is representative of the supply chain as a whole to explore uh, the appropriate answers to that question that you've just asked. And ultimately, our view is that we need to do that together in order to achieve the type of strategic policy that's critical for success. Right, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense to have that sort of uh, unified and, and integrated approach on, on how to do this. I guess, you know, one thing that I kind of just sort of wonder about, so and you've identified a lot of different components that have to be addressed to be able to kind of advance this forward. One thing that you, know, you put a lot of emphasis on is, is simply this, the downstream market opportunities. Is there a way in which you kind of see Canada almost sort of catching the wave a little bit from, from the U.S. if the U.S. continues to kind of pursue a, a relocation policy, right? Like I'm assuming that, you know, you said there's no downstream opportunities in North America. Does this mean that most of those uh, manufacturing facilities are in fact located in, in China? Like has China at this point kind of created a, a fairly strong coupling between its upstream processes and the immediate downstream market? I think that 
there is far downstream demand for rare earth magnets in in North America, but there's no rare earth magnet manufacturers that right. I that I'm aware of, um, and there's no processing facilities that take the rare earth ores or you know elements from the waste streams and uh, you know, turn those into the products that that ultimately are made into the batteries, right? So it's that segment of the supply chain that I think really needs to be be established, strengthened, and, and bolstered. But for example, I was on a panel. I moderated a panel on Tuesday at a Canada U.S. business to business workshop, and there was a, an energy director from Lockheed Martin who was talking about the demand that they have for these rare earth magnets in their energy business. And so we know that there are companies that are seeking to differentiate their existing supply chain to, to a new source to come back to that um, question, to come back to the answer I gave your last question. I think we need to work more closely together in answering what, what can and should be done to achieve success in that space for all parties. Mac has a view on aspects that affect our segment of the supply chain in the extractive space, but there are other perspectives from other companies that, that ultimately need to be taken into account for those downstream uh, supply chain perspectives as well. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And I suppose, I guess, turning back on this, this seems to be a an all-hands-on-deck kind of uh, initiative. You need to make sure you have everyone present. Um, from industry, of course, to our you know, your mining members, and I guess government as well. And you know, I think you're you're pretty clear that you know there was a lot of foresight and you know really excellent planning by this government in terms of uh, signing that that MOU on this. You know, as you move forward, are there some future roles that you think government may need to play in this space to to get this moving? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the MOU is a framework for dialogue. The action plan is more substantial than that, but I think what we're waiting for uh, is deliverables, action, right? So, you know, we, we've made recommendations. We know that significant amount of work analyzing what can and should be done inside of government has already occurred. And I think that the next step is we need a suite of policies and, and measures to be announced, you know, in an, in an upcoming fiscal statement or budget that clearly signals that the, the government of Canada is coming to the table with capacity and tools to uh, collaborate with our allies and achieve the success that we all understand is possible on this file. And right. it's, it's Max understanding that, you know, budget 2020 was delayed due to COVID. It's our understanding that there may have been uh, some of those tools that I just spoke about in that budget were it not to have been delayed. So, you know, I, I don't want folks to, to take my comments as critical that the government is slow. We're moving through a global pandemic here. Uh, there needs to be a certain level of, of, of sensitivity and appreciation to that. I guess I would say I don't believe that the, the government doesn't appreciate the role that it needs to play in this space. And I'm confident that there will be tools and measures coming forward to, to position Canada for success on this file. Makes more sense. I guess, and this is something, um, just as, as you kind of raised it, I, I'm curious about this because there's no secret that uh, COVID has certainly changed, I think, a lot of the terrain for Canada's resource companies, you know, just in terms of shifts in demand, closing points of relative sort of fragility um, in terms of supply chains. And of course, uh, you know, in some cases, at least for sort of the oil and gas sector, it's pretty clear in terms of significant demand destruction. Has COVID changed uh, sort of any any of your views on sort of how a critical mineral and metals plan might operate and sort of the need? Are there are there new opportunities that have been presented post COVID? Are there unique challenges from it, or is it basically the, the state of play uh, the same as it was before? Well, there's a lot there's a lot that can be said on that question, and I'll try and take it one step at a time. The the, the first thing I'd say is that um, in the early days there was there was massive uncertainty you know, huge uh, market volatility in, across a number of commodities. And, you know, we're talking about March, April, April, May window of time. Flash forward, you know, prices for not all, but a, a significant number of commodities have restabilized. And some of them, uh, some of those commodities are at higher prices than they were pre-COVID. 
So from a market standpoint, the, the global mining industry has largely rebounded uh, when compared to, to some other sectors have not. Um, that doesn't mean that every company is, you know, situated the same, like everybody has unique challenges. But generally speaking, I think the industry in Canada has adapted. They've put in substantial safety policies built on a pre-existing strong foundation that have built confidence with their communities, built confidence with their workforce that they can continue operating in a safe and, and secure way. And, you know, there ha while there have been some instances of COVID in the mining industry, uh, they've been far and few between. And I think that that's an indication of the, the safety culture that the industry has. When you think about the impact of COVID vis-a-vis -vis critical minerals, we talked earlier about how critical minerals is, is ultimately sort of a supply constraint issue. And COVID, I think, brought into sharp relief the fragility of the supply chains for a number of products, some of which are consumed by Canadians every day. And what I mean by that are, you know, if you think about back in, in the early days, uh, personal protective equipment, flour, toilet paper, like these were things that were flying off the, the, the shelves and faster than they could be replaced. And I think that um, my, my observation would be that there's likely a greater desire in Canada now than there was before for the local sourcing and domestic production of these goods on which Canadians rely. And I think that that, if anything, is more consistent with the types of supply constraints that led to the critical minerals collaboration between Canada and the U.S., Canada, the EU, et cetera. So there, there's probably a greater alignment, I would say, between the attitudes of Canadians on, on the desire to produce and be more self-reliant on these essential products now as a result of COVID than perhaps there was before. So that bodes well, I think, for broader support in, in advancing the critical minerals agenda. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we've sort of focused a lot here on, on the U.S., and I think that's for a lot of pragmatic reasons. Um, but, you know, you have mentioned the EU a few times. I kind of wonder a little bit more, just sort of trying to take us a little bit away from critical minerals and metals to an extent, but in the same realm. What are our opportunities looking like there uh, to sort of coordinate this type of plan? And also, you know, I know as an industry, you know, Canadian mining companies have sort of both from sort of federal signals, but also from provincial levels, adhere to a pretty like uh, a paragon in terms of sort of environmental management protection and sort of managing emissions. And generally our minerals do benefit uh, from being of a lower carbon intensity because of the, the energy supplies that we, we have as well as the technologies. I'm curious, you know, do you see this in a way, you know, could we have a sort of another way in which that upstream kind of demand gets stimulated for Canadian products if the EU were to pursue sort of a carbon border adjustment policy? You know, is that something that's sort of been factored into these dynamics? Um, well, I, I think, you know, first of all, on the first part of the question, vis-a-vis -vis Canada and the EU, I know that um, there have been uh, established an ongoing engagement between, between Canada and the EU on this file. I personally have been participating in conversations and projects for over five years uh, in this space. And I think that there's a recognized opportunity from parties on both sides of the border. There's also pre-established uh, mineral and investment supply chains in the, in the mining, metal manufacturing space uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. I think that with respect, so one of the reasons why I focus more on the U.S. is that the integration of the Canadian economy and the U.S. economy is unparalleled anywhere else in the world. And so for that reason, I think a recognition of the closeness and nearness to home um, with the level of, like I said, integration between companies, supply chains, and, and, and economies, generally speaking, between their respective countries. And so I think that's one of the reasons why um, perhaps I've placed a bit more emphasis on that uh, dialogue in particular. Uh, you're, you had a second question about carbon border adjustments there. Look, carbon border adjustments, I think, present their own unique set of, of complications. What I would say, you know, complexities rather, and it's hard to comment on a policy that's not complete. Uh, and obviously with something like that in the trade space, the, the devil's in the details. So I would reserve any, you know, comments until you could see something on the table and assess it more uh, accurately. 
when you think about climate change, generally speaking, though, uh, I think there's definitely a lot of resonance between critical minerals as essential inputs into clean energy technologies like battery, electric vehicles, you know, renewable power, um, a whole swath of similar technologies ultimately designed to try and uh, reduce carbon emissions and the the fact that Canada in many instances is a leader in low carbon intensity production of a number of those minerals and metals. Nickel, for example, Canada produces the lowest carbon intensity nickel of anywhere in the world. So to, to, to get at your underlying point, I do think that there are a, a lot of synergies there and I don't think that uh, those are lost on those that are looking at the bigger picture here. And I think that ultimately that will position Canada well and Canada's mining industry well for, for future developments in the critical mineral space. Oh, very cool. You know, I think we're kind of probably getting uh, towards the tail end of our, our conversation here. I suppose, Brendan, I think you've really outlined, you know, what's the advantages and the opportunities that are ahead of us uh, to kind of pursue, you know, a, a critical mineral strategy, uh, ensure that, you know, we have alignment with our trade partners on this and sort of to, to work through some of the challenges, and especially, you know, developing that kind of integrative approach to this to ensure that we do start to attract those players that would create, you know, more downstream demand if not in Canada, then at least in North America. I'm, you know, I, this is sort of a, a bit of a speculative question in many respects, but you know, what, what's at stake here if we don't get this right? Well, I think, I think what's at stake is a, is a lost opportunity. And um, at, the, at the end of the day, my sense is I'm more optimistic given the place that, Canadian decision makers entered this process formally, the efforts have been put forward to date, the ongoing dialogue, not just with the US, with the EU, with Japan, uh, and also I, what I think is a trend in, in geopolitics that is not likely to uh, abate. And I think we're going to see this becoming more essential, and I think Canada is well positioned to succeed in this area. I think the, the biggest question is, um, how much of this opportunity are we going to be able to capture? And we have competitors in the space. This is not this is not a home run. Nothing in the global mining industry is, but we have a lot of resiliency. We have a lot of strengths. We talked about the low carbon intensity. We talked about the efforts of government to position the sector for success. Mac is acutely aware of and deeply involved in these conversations as well. And I think that ultimately we we do have the fixings for uh, a Team Canada approach on this. Um, and we're gonna continue working towards that that success. Great, you know, I, I think that's a, a great view to have on it and I, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of advantages that are gonna position Canada for success in a number of areas. And uh, I think that, you know, the mineral sector and our mining and metal sectors definitely no, you know, no exception there in terms of the, the opportunities that are ahead. Last thing really quickly, you know, uh, have you read anything interesting and, uh, and what's the last thing you read? Uh, generally speaking? Generally speaking, yeah. Generally speaking. Ah, okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm currently uh, working my way through Donald Savoie's The Disintegration of Our Institutions. Savoie is a, a recognized Canadian leader in uh, writing about government, government administration, and process. And so I'm a bit of a nerd. Uh, on that front and uh, really enjoying the book. I, I'd recommend it for anybody who wants to get some deeper insight into how our brand of federalism works and ultimately how the process and machinery of government work as well. It's, it's an accessible but extraordinarily informed look under the hood, so to speak, of our, of our government. That sounds, you know, that sounds very interesting and very timely. Uh, what's the title again? Uh, the disintegration of our institutions. Perfect. Wow. All right, uh, Brendan, thanks so much for uh, joining me on the podcast today. I, I really appreciate it, and uh, thank, and also thank you for such an insightful conversation. I know our uh, our listeners will be interested. Hey, look, thanks for the invitation. Happy to chat, and um, we'll carry the conversation on going forward.
want to thank everybody for tuning into the conversation today. I hope you want to continue to stay engaged with us as we continue to explore the critical role Canada's resource sector plays in supporting Indigenous communities in business development, creating new technologies that are going to guide our path forward to a lower carbon economy, as well as developing practices of sustainability and innovation. And finally, just understanding the interconnected relationship and interdependencies that make the resource sector in Canada a key driver in social and economic development in small communities and large communities across Canada. And if you like what you heard, please uh, make sure to check out rotf.ca for new episodes and updates about the sector. If you want to continue to add support to this conversation, please feel free to share this episode on social media and maybe consider using some of these hashtags. Hashtag ROTF, hashtag resource champions, hashtag Canada's natural advantage. But we also look forward to seeing whatever you come up with as well. Thanks for joining us today and we look forward to having you in the conversation in the future.